More breaking news this hour. Well, the breaking news of the night. We're following developing news this hour. There has been a freakish fatal accident involving a Learjet flying across the country with no one in control. What do you get when you mix the world's greatest players with one of the hardest golf courses ever? An absolute classic. Combine that with a tragedy which would happen a mere four months later and you get one of the most polarizing tournaments in history. Three young guns look to dominate Pinehurst number two, one man in his 40s trying to stop them. Moreover, he's battling the memory of a blown four-shot lead 12 months ago, which saw him lose the 98 US Open. Payne Stewart is trying to etch his name in history with a third major title. But can he beat the field? That's the question this week. Yet four months later, other questions were asked, like why? Or how could this happen? This is the story of Payne Stewart and the 1999 U.S. Open. I'm sure most of you know who Payne Stewart is, but before we get to 1999, let's briefly look at how we got there. Payne Stewart was born William Payne Stewart on January 30th, 1957 in Springfield, Missouri. His dad, Bill, was a traveling salesman who loved golf and exposed him to the game at a young age. Payne quickly fell in love with the sport. As a teenager, Stewart excelled athletically, participating in various sports, including football, track, and golf, which would become his true calling. His exceptional golfing abilities caught the attention of college recruiters, and he received a scholarship to attend Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. In 1979, after completing his education, Payne Stewart turned professional, joining the PGA Tour in 1982. The first thing everyone noticed about Payne Stewart was how he dressed. The story goes that his dad once told him, if you stand out when you go to sell somebody something, they'll remember who you are. But if you come dressed in a boring navy suit, you'll just be another person in the crowd. Stewart definitely stood out with his clothes, but also with his game. It didn't take very long for him to prove that. He won his first year on tour at the 1982 Quad Cities Open, then again in 83 in the Walt Disney World Classic. He claimed Bay Hill in 87 with a three-stroke margin of victory, and was also victorious at the Heritage Golf Classic in 1989. That same year, he entered the grounds at Kemper Lakes Golf Club for the PGA Championship. He posted a four-round score of 12 under par, but still, Mike Reed was in control. That all changed with a bogey on the 16th and a double bogey on 17. Suddenly, Payne was in the lead. Reed couldn't birdie the last hole, meaning Payne Stewart was the 1989 PGA Champion, his first major. However, this win didn't sit right for some people. They say his actions on camera while Reed was having a meltdown displayed arrogance and selfishness. I felt if I could shoot 31 on the back, but uh, you never know what's liable to happen. We'll see where Mike's got one hole to play, but I like my position now. Others gave him a pass. Whatever the case, the Payne Stewart we witnessed in 1999 wasn't the same man we saw here. There's a fantastic book written about Payne's life by Kevin Robbins called The Last Stand of Payne Stewart. It's a fascinating story, one I highly recommend. In it, the author states that years later, Payne apologized to Mike Reed. Kevin Robbins also writes how the next day after winning the Wanamaker Trophy, while in Oregon for a charity event, Stewart gets up on stage, slightly drunk, stares Palmer right in the eyes, and says, Arnold, don't you wish you had one of these? Arnold and the crowd apparently forced a laugh. But don't think younger Payne Stewart didn't engage in kind acts. Look no further than his donating, not a quarter or a half, but all of his winnings from the 87 Bay Hill to a Florida hospital, which was to help establish a house for cancer patients' relatives. Payne's dad died of cancer in 1985. On Payne Stewart's swing, just like everybody else who describes it, it's a pure, smooth, swinging motion. A masterpiece developed from years of hitting golf balls, and his love of music probably had a hand in how rhythmic it was. Payne would win the Heritage Golf Classic again, and the Byron Nelson in 1990. He followed that up with his second major title, a US Open in 91 at Hazeltine. He would then win the 1995 Shell Houston Open, 
but he wanted another major title, and in 1998, he had an excellent chance to win his third. The 98 US Open was at Olympic Club. I got off to a slow start, but I knew that I'm... No, no, not this US Open at Olympic Club. 14 years earlier, Payne Stewart had a four-shot lead going into the final day. He found a sand divot on the 12th hole and couldn't recover. Lee Jansen posted a 68, a two under par round, and was suddenly in the lead. Payne was one shot back and needed to sink this birdie putt to force an 18-hole playoff the next day. It was not to be. Lee Jansen emerged as the winner, securing his second US Open victory. I didn't go out and do what it, it took to win the, the golf tournament today. I, made too many bogeys, I, I didn't hit enough fairways, didn't hit enough greens. This defeat, while painful, didn't deter him. He went out the next year and won at Pebble Beach. Moreover, he would have another crack at the United States Open. It would be played on the legendary Pinehurst No. 2, which is a golf course steeped in history and revered by golfers everywhere. Designed by renowned golf course architect Donald Ross and completed in 1907, this course demands both precision and strategy. However, it's the greens at Pinehurst No. 2 that truly set it apart. The meticulously crafted crown greens with their undulating and tricky slopes present a massive challenge. The question it asks all golfers, can you put the ball in a place where it will stay on the greens? It's where champions are made and golfing legacies are born. It's here where the 99th US Open will take place. Tracy Stewart, Payne's wife, said he went to Pinehurst the Saturday before with his coach, Chuck Cook, who had been coaching him since 1989. His caddy, Mike Hicks, stated he had never seen Payne prepare as much as he had for this tournament. Although, he was definitely not the favorite to win this week. He missed the cut the week before in Memphis. This tournament had stiff competition, like Phil Mickelson, who was still looking for his first major title. Vijay Singh with one win in six top ten so far this year. Tiger Woods, after his magical victory in the 1997 Masters, he sought his second major title. And the current number one ranked player in the world, David Duvall. He already had four wins this year and shot a 59 to win the ball. Bob Hope Chrysler Classic. All four of these players will be in competition on Sunday, as will Payne Stewart, who looked to be in huge trouble on Saturday. At one point he was three under, but then suffered three straight bogeys, including missing a par putt on number 10. He stopped that bleeding on number 11 with this par save. Phil Mickelson, who is four under, posts four bogeys on the back nine. Payne Stewart has this birdie putt on 18 to head into Sunday and become the only player after three days to post an under par round. Payne Stewart heads into the final round leading the tournament by one. You know, I, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I, I, I wanted this opportunity and now I, I gotta go out and deal with it. Here we go, the final of the 1999 US Open, and what a round of golf this is. You can see the whole video on the USGA's YouTube channel. We are also greeted by the sweet sounds of Johnny Miller. I know a lot of people don't like his commentary, but yeah, I think he's pretty great. This is the leaderboard going into the final round. Payne Stewart has a one-shot lead over Phil Mickelson, Tiger Woods two back, as is Tim Heron, David Duvall, and Vijay Singh three back. Corey Pavin showing just how difficult Pinehurst number two is, especially during a US Open. And this kind of stuff happened all day. Okay, you finally got a chance to get an autograph signed by your favorite player. He's right there. All you need to do is hand it to him. All you need to do is hand it to him. You go home empty handed. The rough is difficult here at Pinehurst and Jim Furyk decides to make it even harder by using a fairway wood. I discussed this in my John Daly video, but here it is again. This was JD on number eight where he gets frustrated with how the course is set up and how the greens are. Payne Stewart showing up, signing autographs for his fans. Johnny, what do you think of Stewart's outfit right now? Those are quite the shoes there with that outfit. After his round, JD says he won't watch the, well, here. Just listen. Uh, I'm not going to go to Pebble and watch the USGA run that golf course either. Thank you for your comments. You got it. 
Actually, he did go to Pebble Beach the next year for the US Open. He shot an 83 and withdrew after the first round. So obviously, he was extremely heated after this tournament. Here's Duval in great spirits looking for his first major title after a dominating season. And Payne Stewart, who's fired up today preparing to tackle Pinehurst. You have a little oops, uh, and then they go Whew. And here's Tiger walking in like he owns the place. Jesper Parnovic for birdie at number two. Azinger shows us how to play out of this rough. Yeah, that was quite good, wasn't it? Daly had big problems on the eighth hole. Well, here's another golfer in a similar spot. Yoko's ball comes all the way back to him, not once, but twice. And honestly, all he can do is point and laugh. Davis Love out of the thick rough and... Oh. Phil gets interviewed, as does Tiger. All we need now is a Tim Heron interview, which actually it never happens. They never give him a pre-match interview. Sorry, Lumpy. But don't worry, Tiger won't let you be forgotten. You're playing with Tim Heron today. Good pairing? That's a great pairing. Tim and I are good friends. Parnovic for birdie on number four. Yes, but Parnovic uh, just named the latest of his daughters Pebble Peach. Wait a second. What? Pebble Peach. Let me see here. Yeah, Pebble Peach and Peg. Peg Parnovic. Pain using his brain by cutting the sleeves off the jacket. He probably hates that restricted feeling of swinging in the rain gear. David Duvall and his opening tee shot. It heads left and someone in the crowd has jokes. Have fun, guys. Still with Duvall, he's trying to figure out his next shot, but having a problem getting the fans to move. This man is about to play a tough shot out of the pine straw and people are almost daring him to hit them. David doesn't hit them and pulls off the shot well. Vijay Singh with his opening tee shot. And I really do love Vijay's swing. It's beautiful. I know the internet loves to hate Vijay, but man, his swing was art. Hey, could we get a shot of Tiger putting on some chapstick? Thank you. Tiger Woods first ball. And here's one by his playing partner, Tim Heron. Duval with a laser approach and would tap that in for birdie. One of the few happy moments for him today. Phil tees off as well as Payne Stewart and giddy up, we are in for quite the round. Duval here with a nice birdie on number three. Stewart with a fantastic approach on number one and he's off to a good start. He would go on to make that birdie putt. Phil with the par save on the first. Tiger bombs his approach shot over the third green and... This has got a bite, Johnny. I don't know why that guy's clapping. A chipping battle here on the second hole between Stewart and Mickelson. And really, it's a battle pretty much anybody is losing against Phil. And it's no different here. Payne's ball rolls back down and Phil executes a good shot and saves par. Stewart lags it up with his putter and makes his bogey putt to drop one shot. He's leading by one. These were the cruel stats in the fifth hole this week, which was playing the hardest. Payne Stewart with a dazzling shot on number three where he would make that birdie putt to get back to one under. Tiger Woods with a driver off the deck, which is one of the most exciting plays in golf, although it still comes up a little short on the huge par five fourth. Heron pushes his ball to the right and needs a quick smoke break after. Tim misses and at this point, Lumpy is getting no respect out there. Tough to accept, accept bogey, bogey on this hole today. Tiger for an easy birdie and he's only two back of the leader. Duval drops a shot on number six. Incredibly, Payne Stewart found another sand-filled divot. And remember, the same thing happened to him last year at the US Open, and he sent that ball into the bunker. This year, same results. But plays a beautiful bunker shot and has an easy par save. Phil parred the hole as well. Tim Heron gets a birdie and Tiger bogeyed. Still with Lumpy, he faces some trouble out of the bunker at six. The ball rolls backward, and then the course tries to kill him. This shot from Phil showed just how punishing Pinehurst 2 is. Looks like a safe shot and all is good, only it ends up rolling off the front. Both he and Payne would make par. Duvall has a bunker shot with a buried lie. It starts to pick up speed, it keeps going past the hole, and it's gone as are his chances of winning. The course also puts the final dagger in Tim Heron's chances with this bunker shot. His hopes of winning are sealed. This reaction tells us all we need to know about Tiger's drive off the eighth. Long birdie putt from Payne on number seven. It has some speed, but almost drops. Mickelson drains this nice putt on number seven and Johnny loses it. That looks good. It's down. He's one back of Stewart. Payne with a long lag putt on the next hole. 
hole and ends up making the par, as does Phil. Tiger using a wood for a bump and run, and honestly, I haven't seen a pro use this in a long time. Goitus gets Pinehursts on number 12, as his ball just simply won't stay on the green. VJ makes birdie on number 10. On nine, Payne Stewart pulls his ball to the left and finds the bunker. This shot was played brilliantly and he ends up saving par. He's still two under for the tournament. After this tee shot on number 10, which hits a fairway, Johnny Miller tells us, That's eight fairways out of eight tries today. Interesting decision by the director to show us this. And this guy wonders if this would be a good time to ask for an autograph. What do you think Tim is saying to Tiger here? Comment down below. Phil with his own driver from the fairway on the long par five, but he still can't reach in two. Bain doesn't catch this flush, and the ball rolls back off the green in an awkward lie. The following chip doesn't get to where it needs to be. Payne misses the par putt, so does Tiger, and Phil makes his, so after 10 holes, he and Payne Stewart are tied for the lead at one under. Payne misses another green, three in a row, and can't believe it. He follows it up with this putt, which looks awful from here, but it ends up pretty damn good. Afterward, he swipes the sand away. He asked for a ruling on if he could move the sand from his line, but because it wasn't on the green, they said no. He goes on to save par. Phil Mickelson just misses his birdie effort. VJ on 13, up the hill and... Walking putt! Back to the co-leader on 12, he misses his first fairway of the day. VJ for a nice birdie! Oh, come on! Pain after some trouble on this hole. For par and he misses, meaning Phil is now the leader at one under. Phil's approach on 13 stays on the green, and Payne is trying to get one back after dropping a shot on the last. Tiger showing all the charisma which helped the game of golf grow. Payne Stewart will not go away, gaining back a share of the lead. This shot puts VJ out of the tournament and would finish tied for third. It was on the right today, it's on the left. Payne Stewart with another long par save, and my goodness, he was on fire with a short stick today. Phil made a great two putt, and they are both tied for the lead. This bump and run goes past the hole, and Payne will miss the par putt to drop a shot. Phil with a long birdie try. Ooh, lips out, but would save par. Tiger Woods to get to even par. Phil's tee shot on the long par 4 16th. Perfection. Payne cranked his ball down there as well, and it rolls just past Mickelson's. Phil Mickelson smashes his second shot, and it sounds good, but it comes up short. Stewart's ball also doesn't make it onto the green. A miss hit from Payne happens next, and Johnny Miller asks the question you may have been asking yourself. What is that, Roger? This chip comes up short from lefty. Payne's eyeing this up. It's a long save for par. Here it goes, and watch this magic. Straight in. Incredible putting performance from Mr. Stewart, and he's not done yet. Phil does not have the same success. He pulls it. Tiger also has trouble with this par attempt and drops a shot, finishing tied third with VJ. It's a two-man race. Payne Stewart with this picture-perfect iron into number 17 and drops it close to the hole. Phil, not to be outdone, executes this. Boy, this is going right in the same line as Payne's. Oh, what a shot! It's a putting battle but Phil pulls it again and misses. Payne makes his birdie and now has a one-shot lead with just one hole to play. On the 18th, Stewart hits his ball into the deep rough, which could be a huge problem, and Mickelson hammers it down the fairway. Pinehurst, are you gonna give Lumpy any love yet? Another lip out. The leader decides to lay up here and try to limit the damage. Phil comes up a little short, but still has a chance for birdie. Payne Stewart in trouble. He walks off the yardage and heads back to his ball. He sends it at the hole and, okay, he's got that left for par. Phil to tie for the lead. The putt looks good, but uh, it was given just a bit too much break and he taps it in for par. Payne Stewart needs to hold this to win outright. If he misses, well, there will be a playoff tomorrow. And Johnny Miller knows how hard a putt like this is. The odds are quite good that there will be a playoff. Here we go to win the US Open for a second time. Payne Stewart is the winner of the 99 US Open. What a tournament, what a round, and what a performance.
24 putts today. There's never been a player that's made three putts of that length the last three holes to win by one in a major championship that I can remember. No wrist action, no wrist action, no wrist action. Finally, past halfway, past parallel, straight left arm. Look at him clear his left hips. Arms extended through the ball, total flowing swing, big follow through. That does not look like a guy that's uh, in his 40s. That swing might last a while. Four months later, on Monday, October 25th, Payne Stewart was boarding a Learjet 35 in Orlando, Florida, which was scheduled to fly to Dallas, Texas. He and golf course architect Bruce Borland were headed to Southern Methodist University to talk about building a new golf course for the school program. Also on board were Van Arden and Robert Fraley, Stewart's agents, and the Jets crew, pilot Michael Kling, and co-pilot Stephanie Belagarigue. The plane took off at 9.19 a.m. Eight minutes later, the air traffic controller told the pilot to climb and maintain the flight level of 39,000 feet. Stephanie Belagarigue responded and confirmed. But there was a problem. The air traffic controller tried to contact the flight four more times and received no response. At 9.54, a United States Air Force F-16 pilot was ordered to intercept the Learjet. The uh, front to cockpit is uh, either frosted or uh, condensed over. I can't see inside the, uh, in the cockpit. The frosted windows seemed to confirm that this was possibly due to a loss of cabin pressure and that all six members on board were likely incapacitated. The airplane's original destination was Dallas, but it failed to make the westward turn. It was heading straight and would keep flying until it was fuelless. The plane ran out of fuel, and after three hours and 54 minutes of flight time, it crashed into a South Dakota field. Payne Stewart and the five other people were pronounced dead at approximately 12.15 local time. The golf world was left stunned. One of its mainstay players over the last 17 years was gone. The Tour Championship, which was being held this week, would still go forward, although in a much more somber tone. It was dedicated to the life of Payne Stewart and featured a solo bagpipe player walking down the first hole. A memorial site was created for the six deceased people at the Learjet crash location. The 2000 United States Open was played at Pebble Beach. A 21 ball salute was done to honor the defending champion. A year after the crash, Tracy Stewart and the family of agent Robert Fraley sued Learjet for $200 million, claiming a cracked piece of equipment caused cabin air to escape. Learjet countered that argument, putting the blame solely on Sunjet Aviation, the now defunct company that operated the jet, stating that the aircraft was poorly maintained by Sunjet. In 2005, a jury of six women cleared Learjet of responsibility for the 1999 deaths. Four days after the plane went down, there was a memorial service for Payne Stewart. Many players and professionals from golf showed up, including Payne's great friend Paul Azinger, who delivered a masterful eulogy. How many times did Payne Stewart ask me if I got a free bowl of soup with that hat? <laughs> to try to accept the magnitude of this tragedy, is the most difficult thing that I've ever had to do. He only played to win. This was all he ever knew. But not long ago, we started to see something new, something totally different. We saw a man who was interested in people. He was as interested in people as he was in golf. Goodbye, man. <laughs> Goodbye, Robert. Goodbye, Paint. <sighs> and we loved you, and we will miss you, but we know we will see you again. This tragedy hits hard. I remember watching the 1999 US Open as a kid. I was a big Tiger Woods fan then, but that week I was captivated by a player who dressed differently than everybody else. One who seemed so focused and determined. I watched him conquer the field and the course that day. I still think about the celebration, the elation, the joy. I had a new favorite player, then the news story, the tragedy. Payne Stewart was gone. I didn't understand why he was taken then. I still don't understand it today. All I know is that he was one of a kind. A man who loved his family, his sport, his country, and God. He played on five Ryder Cup teams, won 11 times on tour, with three major victories. He also went through quite a character arc. 
from what some would claim was one of the more disliked players on tour to a class act. When Paul Azinger went through cancer, he spoke that many of his friends disappeared, but not Payne Stewart. The two became closer. During the 1999 Ryder Cup, after Colin Montgomery was heckled relentlessly by the Boston fans, Payne Stewart conceded Colin's putt on 18 giving him the match since America had already won the cup. Stewart later said, This game is about sportsmanship. Maybe his transformation was all thanks to his rekindled faith in God. Pain became gracious in victory and gracious in defeat. And only God could do that because only God can change hearts. Though, I'm sure he learned much about life through his many experiences. We all saw his pride and his occasional cynicism and sarcasm begin to soften. I believe the death of Payne's father started this process. And the highs and lows that come with being world-class at something. How competitive would Payne Stewart have been going forward? We will never know. Tiger Woods was about to take off and dominate the sport in a way rarely seen. But there's no doubt Payne would have stayed in golf. He would have kept competing at the highest level, captained a Ryder Cup team, and absolutely, he would have been on more leaderboards at the US Open. Payne Stewart is gone. But thanks to video and the meticulous recording of the sport we love, we get to relive past moments and watch our heroes in their finest hour. And remember just how much impact they had on their family, golf, and even us as viewers. If you want to know Payne Stewart, but never got the chance to meet him in person, his victory at Pinehurst will tell you all you need to know. At 42 years old, he conquered the memory of that loss in 98. He bested Woods, a prime Duval, and Mickelson on a brutally hard course, and he showed nothing but humility in victory. For me, when I think of a US Open, it's this one. And I am forever grateful for what Payne Stewart taught me that day about life through a TV screen. On the way home, something would happen and I can't play golf again. Hey, I've, I've had a wonderful career. Golf isn't everything in, in my life. I mean, I have a beautiful family. I have a wonderful wife and two lovely children. Mm -hmm.